specific, it's rapid, um, and it will do the best it can to help protect you from microorganisms getting in and doing more things. It's a very generalized response. The innate immune system, I, I believe I mentioned, really is not only to protect you from infection, but also to help clear up damage or injury. You get a very, very similar response to injury and infection. And that general response is because of proteins or molecules that are induced with infection or with damage. And when we're talking about molecules that infectious agents have that are recognized by the innate immune system, we call them PAMPs. And PAMP is an acronym for Pathogen Associated Molecular Pattern. It could be something like peptidoglycan, it could be LPS, uh, something that a microbe has that triggers the innate immune system. It doesn't matter what bacterium it is, it's peptidoglycan, we know that that's bad. It's LPS, we know that that's bad. When the innate immune system is activated to help clean up maybe after an injury, it's recognizing um, patterns or molecules that are produced because of that injury. And so we call those DAMPs, damage associated molecular patterns. Uh, that could be proteins or molecules produced on the internal part of a cell. So if a cell uh, lyses, cells shouldn't lyse. Um, cells that are damaged could potentially be releasing cytokines that could trigger a response. Okay. So PAMPs and DAMPs are what we're responding to. And this innate immune system really is our first line of defense. Um, and these are very, very nonspecific. Um, even people who are immune compromised have a lot of these features. Uh, that would include something like intact skin. Intact skin is an awesome barrier to protecting against infection. Um, you have antimicrobial peptides that your body produces. Even uh, in your eyes, you have that flushing action of every time you blink to help wipe away microbes so that they can't cause an eye infection. Um, and those secretions, your tears, also produce um, an enzyme called lysozyme. And lysozyme breaks down peptidoglycan. Doesn't matter what species, it just attacks peptidoglycan. So general response that your body has, mucus, ciliated epithelium. So within your respiratory tract, the cells of your respiratory tract are lined with cilia, those little like hair-like projections, and they all beat in the same direction. And we call it the mucociliary escalator, or sometimes people will just call it the ciliary escalator. And these cells are all beating their cilia to bring mucus up and drop it down your esophagus so that it can be digested in your stomach. So any trapped pathogens, dirt, pollutants that get into your mucus hopefully get brought up on the escalator and drop down the esophagus to be destroyed in the stomach. And again, even if you are immune compromised, that should work. Macrophages depends on the immune, the type of immune um, compromised state we have, the immunodeficiency. Maybe they don't have macrophages, but most people do. In the genital tract or the urinary tract, okay, We'll do a very brief anatomy lesson. I was actually surprised that I had to do this in medical microbiology, but we'll do it just in case. I'm assuming you all know, but just in case you don't, uh, in people with female anatomy, there is a separate opening for the reproductive tract, the vagina, and there is a separate opening for the urinary tract, the urethra. They are not the same. So in females, they are separate. In males, they are the same. So the male genital tract and, reprodu and reprodu reproductive tract and urinary tract are the same. So the urethra is also where sperm comes. 
Okay, but in females, they're different. If you have questions, comments, or concerns, please do let me know. But I was very surprised that I had students in med micro that, that weren't aware of that. So there you go, brief anatomy lesson. So in males, the flushing action of the urine can protect both their urinary tract and their reproductive tract. Okay, in females, the flushing action of the urine or the acidity of the urine only protects the urinary tract. So it can help wash away any bacteria that might be trying to get up the urinary tract, but it does not protect the genital tract. What can protect the genital tract in females uh, are the vaginal secretions. It's slightly acidic, so that can help. There are also things like lysozyme in vaginal secretions that can help prevent microbes from establishing um, a vaginal infection. Okay, so people with female anatomy, you have to worry about either urinary tract infections or vaginal infections, totally different. Um, males, you really worry about the one. Okay. The digestive tract, we also have our innate immune barriers. Stomach acidity is awesome. That can help get rid of lots of microorganisms that you ingest on a daily basis, especially those of you who like to live dangerously and eat undercooked meat. I'm looking at you, sushi lovers. You like your rare steak? I'm looking at you too. Okay. You have your normal flora, which also helps protect any of those, uh, it helps protect your gut, hopefully from any invaders establishing an infection. You have bile, which can help um, protect, and you have mucus. So for the most part, right? Every person on the planet should have all of these things and they should help protect against very broadly any type of infection. So it's really important for us to think about and appreciate, man, we should have lots of infections, but we usually don't as long as you're not immune compromised. So those of you who have a healthy immune system, you really should have a lot more infections than you do. So these barriers work the majority of the time. Within that innate response um, are some chemical components, or we call them soluble components. These will be things that are found like in your plasma um, or in other liquid secretions. So we have antimicrobial peptides and ion chelators. So the antimicrobial peptides uh, can do a few different things. We talked about lysozyme, which can break down uh, peptidoglycan. We have other uh, antimicrobial peptides that can help induce uh, immune cell migration, like chemokines, to get immune cells to come to the area. We have antimicrobial peptides that can directly punch holes in cell membranes to disrupt the microorganism. Um, and ion chelators are important because microorganisms, just like us, uh, require ions to do mostly enzymatic functions. That's usually why we need ions. And so what our body can try to do is sequester those ions and keep them away from the microorganism. And when we talk about different microorganisms, we'll talk about how a lot of them also try to steal them back. So there's this little ion battle that goes on, but that's part of our defense is to sequester our ions and prevent the microbes from having them. We have the complement pathway, which is for the most part considered part of the innate immune system. Those of you who've taken immunology have probably spent some time talking about the different pathways of activating complement. Um, we have the classic pathway, the lectin pathway, and the alternate pathway. This is not immunology, so I'm not gonna ask you to describe all of these complement pathways. Uh, the reason that I say for the most part we consider complement to be part of the innate immune system is because for the most part you don't need anything specific to trigger it. Microbial proteins will trigger it, microbial proteins will trigger it. The exception is the classical pathway. The classical pathway is activated by antibody antigen interactions. So to me that requires a little bit of the adaptive response as well. But I think I mentioned that on Wednesday, we can't really consider these things in a bubble. They do interact with one another, innate and adaptive. But the point of complement, 
right, to these, especially these two antibody independent, what complement ends up doing, no matter how you start it, if you start it with um, the lectin pathway, if you start it with the alternate pathway, or if you start it with the classical pathway, the end result is a complex of proteins called the membrane attack complex, or the MAC. It punches holes in cell membranes. And when there are holes in the cell membrane, that disrupts the cell. Cellular contents can leak out, extracellular contents can come in. Usually it's a leaking out, and that causes the cell to die. So it's a way to punch holes in the cell membrane and cause the cell to die. Um, and then some of our other soluble components will include interferons, which are really important in the antiviral response. They're a type of cytokine uh, that's really important for the antiviral response. They can interfere with viral replication. If a virus can't replicate, the infection is pretty much over. They can also lead to the um, induction of fever. That increase in the body temperature is sometimes even just a few degrees enough to halt viral replication, um, and they can recruit T cells. One of the challenges with a viral infection is because viruses are intracellular, really one of the best ways to get rid of a viral infection is to kill the infected cell. And there is a class of T cells, cytotoxic T cells or cytolytic T cells, depends on how you want to call it. They induce infected cells to undergo apoptosis or that type of cellular uh, programmed cell death. The cell kills itself because it's infected. So interferons can also help bring those cells to that, uh, those T cells to that infection. Questions about soluble components. Uh, we also have cells or cellular components that we consider to be an important part of our innate immune system. Uh, one branch of these cells are called granulocytes. Uh, when you look at them under a microscope, you can see that they have uh, little vesicles basically within the cell. Those are the, the granules basically. And within the granules are antimicrobial substances. So one class of granulocytes are neutrophils. So they recognize PAMPs, they recognize those pathogen associated molecular patterns. They can help promote phagocytosis, but they can also dump those granules. They can do exocytosis and get those granules out and dump those antimicrobial compounds on the microbe. Part of the challenge and, and one of the reasons that having an infection um, can be painful and can cause local damage is because, you know, they're just kind of dumping antimicrobial compounds everywhere. Sometimes you hit your own cells too. But for the most part, you know, that can help clear up an infection. And neutrophils are actually a major component of pus if you were to look at it under a microscope. Um, the other group of granulocytes, they're kind of grouped together because they're generally found as a very low percentage of the overall leukocyte or white blood cell count, um, include mast cells, basophils, um, and eosinophils. Broadly, again, they are granulocytes, so they have those antimicrobial substances. Um, they are it says here, potent inflammatory, they cause high levels of inflammation. Redness, swelling, pain, heat, that inflammatory process. Um, mast cells and basophils, that's why it's MCB, mast cells and basophils will release histamines. So those of you who have allergies, you love histamines. It causes like the fluid leakage. <clears throat> I thought I had a cold because I have kids, so of course I have a cold, but I think I've got like some weird allergy reaction going on because my kids are fine and I'm still like congested. The antihistamines work really well for me, so I've probably got some mast cells going on, going a little crazy. Okay. The other 
granulocyte here, eosinophils. Mostly are part of our antiparasitic response. In the US, we don't generally get exposed to a ton of parasites. Eosinophils are also highly associated with allergy responses. Okay, so hate them, hate them. No, they're good for us. Sometimes they just respond to the wrong thing. That's what an allergy is. They're responding to a wrong antigen, an antigen that shouldn't be, need a response. Um, the other type of innate immune cell, <coughs> so again, these would be derived, if you picture um, that graph I showed you on Wednesday where you have your uh, pluripotent stem cell and then you go into two different lineages. You go to the myeloid lineage and the lymphocyte lineage. On that myeloid lineage, right, that's where we get our red blood cells, we get our platelets, we get our granulocytes. And the last thing we get in this area um, are some of our phagocytic cells. So we have um, a monocyte macrophage lineage. These are long-lived phagocytic cells. These are considered to be professional uh, antigen-presenting cells. Their job is to present antigen. They don't really have another function. They are phagocytic cells uh, that present antigen. Depending um, on how they've been activated, they can do slightly different things. And so there are two classes of macrophages, M1 and M2. Uh, M1 are usually activated by T helper 1 type cells uh, and interferon gamma, which is a potent, uh, anti uh, potent pro inflammatory cytokine. Um, a cell that has been activated in this way becomes an M1 macrophage and you see M1 macrophages have a lot of different functions inflammation and fever antimicrobial activity anti-tumor activity so when you have um, an infection these are really good fighters for you the other lineage or type of macrophage are the M2 macrophages and again this is just how they got activated what activated that if they got activated by T helper one um, and that pro-inflammatory response, they become very, very potent anti-infection, anti-tumor cleanup cells. If they got activated in a different way by T helper two cells, they do still have some antimicrobial function, right? But the M2 macrophages are actually really important in healing. So these are going to be your tissue repair, your injury repair macrophages. So phagocytosis, right? They clean up anything damaged. Angiogenesis, bring in new blood, bring in new blood cells, fibroblasts, um, and all of the other like connective tissues, chemokines like to recruit. So it's supposed to help you heal. Unfortunately, you see here that it also says <clears throat> tumor promotion. Well, you know, growth of cells is great. If you have an injury, you need new cells to come in and grow and, and heal that injury. If they grow too much, that's cancer. Um, so that's why they say tumor promotion. But uh, often what we'll see um, when people maybe heal a little too well they call it like hypertrophic scarring. Uh, sometimes you get that keloid scarring um, where the body just like really, really rapidly like, tried to close up a wound um, and it just did it not quite right. So those are your macrophages. Um, the other like really important professional uh, antigen presenting cell is your dendritic cell. And these ones are really cool. Um, they have the cell body and then they have all of these like projections. Um, and so they also will be found in blood and tissue uh, once they um, encounter an antigen they will present it so they 
they are the only ones that can initiate a new T cell response. So they're the ones that the first time you ever see an antigen, they're the ones that are gonna turn on that T cell response. Um, you have some that are going to activate T cells and then you have some that will also express antigen to B cells. So you have a lot of crosstalk between these different types of cells um, in the immune system. Let's see if this will work. And so you can see how motile they are. And they can bring in those projections and whatever they've grabbed, right, bring it to the cell body for processing. Creepy and cool all at the same time. Okay. There are other cells uh, that we consider to be part of the innate immune system, but that actually are derived from lymphoid progenitor cells instead of myeloid progenitor cells. So we have some innate lymphoid cells. So they are produced um, from the lymphoid side, but they act a lot like an innate cell because they respond to PAMPs and DAMPs. So they look like T cells, CD4 positive T cells. They produce cytokines like a CD4 positive T cell, but unlike a T cell, they don't respond to a specific antigen. They will respond broadly to PAMPs and DAMPs. We also have probably my favorite cell type name, natural killer cells. Uh, they will kill, they kill. They tell cells that it's time to go. Um, so they respond to viral infection. Remember, one of the best ways to end a viral infection is to have that cell undergo apoptosis. So natural killer cells, just like cytotoxic T cells, can induce that apoptosis. It's also how our body can do what it do the best it can to try to prevent tumor proliferation. So natural killer cells and uh, some of the CD8 positive T cells, the cytotoxic T cells, respond to the abnormal proteins that are produced by tumor cells and try to help prevent them from proliferating. They will increase um, inflammation and they also are involved in what's called antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. If an antibody is bound to a cell, they can kill it. So they're killers. So they're part of the innate immune system, even though they are produced by the lymphoid progenitor cell. There are other cell types that are a lot less common. I, I hesitate to call them new cell types because obviously they're not new. Our bodies have been producing them throughout our evolutionary history. Uh, they're new to science-ish, right? They're things that, you know, when I took this class, when I took immunology that we didn't learn about. So natural killer T cells um, and gamma delta T cells, they are found in tissue and blood. Um, they consider them to be part of the innate immune system because they have limited T cell receptor diversity. They can't respond and be super specific like a regular T cell can. What they tend to do is respond to very specific kinds of antigens, like bacterial phospholipids um, or metabolites produced by bacterium. And like some of the T cells, they'll produce pro-inflammatory cytokines like interferon gamma to activate macrophages and dendritic cells. So they have some behaviors like a T cell. They can activate other cell types. They produce pro-inflammatory cytokines. They do have a classic T cell receptor, but they don't respond in a very specific way uh, like a classic T cell would to a very specific antigen. They don't have that diversity. Um, and again, I'm not going to ask you all of the details about, you know, which one responds to what. What we have as part of our innate immune system in all of our cells are these um, receptors called toll-like receptors, T-O-L-L, toll-like receptors. Um, toll is German for something. I, I can never remember. Um, they're called this in fruit flies, and they look similar in humans, so they're toll-like receptors. 
We have toll-like receptors that are on the surface of our cells that can recognize pathogens. And we have toll-like receptors that are internal in the cells that will recognize um, particular antigens. So that's how the cells recognize that something doesn't belong, because it will bind to one of these toll-like receptors. So it's where the PAMPs bind. So um, on the virus, they're showing that some of the pathogen-associated molecular patterns, the PAMPs of a virus, can include glycoproteins on the virus surface, that's GP. Uh, DNA, the viral DNA could be a trigger. Viral RNA can be a trigger. When we talk more about viruses, um, there are some viruses that are RNA-based, and they will have um, a phase during their replication where they have double-stranded RNA. Our cells don't have double-stranded RNA, so double-stranded RNA is a very potent PAMP that triggers the immune system. With gram-positive bacteria, uh, again, DNA, lipoproteins, LP, peptidoglycan, uh, lipotychoic acids. With gram-negative, DNA, peptidoglycan, LPS, which is right only found in gram-negatives, flagellum, right? So many prokaryotes have a flagellum. Some eukaryotic cells have a flagellum too, but our flagella are made of different things. So theirs are made of a protein called flagellin, and flagellin is a trigger that this is a problem. Uh, fungi, some components of the fungal cell wall are recognized by our um, toll-like receptors, so uh, some of the sugars that they use to make their cell wall. And then uh, protozoans as well. They have these uh, glycoprotein that are recognized. So that's, you know, these general features, and that's why we say it's nonspecific. It doesn't matter what bacterium has peptidoglycan, it's peptidoglycan. It doesn't matter what bacteria produce the LPS, it's LPS, it's a trigger. So that's why we say that it's nonspecific. They respond to pathogens, and that's it. And again, when you have this inflammatory response, I'm not asking you the details of this. I would never, right? But what I'm trying to highlight is how you have all of these interacting pathways where you can get the innate and the adaptive response to an infection. You have different triggers, right? tissue trauma or infection, that can lead to very similar pathways. You drive inflammation. You produce various cytokines and antimicrobial peptides. And you do this every day, mostly without knowing. Everybody does this every day. This does not require any effort on our body's part. It, it will just do it. Um, so unless you are super, super, super severe combined immune deficient, you do this every day. And it works really, really well. Any questions to this point? Next week it's going to get really fun because we're going to talk about all the microbes and what they do. We'll finish up with the immune system probably Monday, and then we'll get into all the microbes. So <clears throat> I told you that one of the things that our cells will produce in response to infection um, are chemokines. They recruit cells to the site of infection. Um, so how specifically do we get that, we call it chemotaxis, right? The response to a chemical signal. So what happens is Let's say, we'll look at the bottom panel. Down here at the bottom, let's say we have some sort of infection um, and we've had the release of various chemokines. Neutrophils, right, or other cells that are gonna come to the area, they sense, right, they bind to those chemicals, they sense them, and they begin moving in the direction to get to the higher concentration. Where is this source of infection? Eventually, as they get closer, they will start interacting with the cells of the blood vessel, the endothelial cells lining the blood vessel. And so we call that rolling. They're basically kind of rolling, physically rolling along the surface 
of the blood vessel. Um, I guess here would have been the spot where I could have, there's a meme of like, they see me rolling and it's like a little <laughs> immune cell. Um, but yeah, okay. So you can picture it in your head. It's like a little, it's like a little immune cell with glasses. They see me rolling. Um, and eventually, as they get closer and closer, uh, they start to make that a tight interaction. The cell will become activated and will really want to keep contact with those cells lining the blood vessel, the endothelial cells. Then it will stick, right? Because rolling, you're not sticking. You're just kind of moving along. Um, and then you're like, okay, now this is where I want to be. But finally, we have to get out of the blood vessel and get to the site of the infection. Um, and so that process by which an immune cell comes through the blood vessel, leaves the blood vessel and goes like, to the tissue, two words, one diapedesis, the other one is extravasation. But since diapedesis is here <clears throat> in this book, that's what we'll use, diapedesis. Now, this, this process is partly why areas of infection or areas of injury get swollen with fluid. These cells are bursting through that tight layer, which can allow other fluid to come out. That might be why you get some redness. Red blood cells will come through as well. So that process, though, is really important. They have to get through. Um, and what happens when they do get through? Phagocytic cells do the best they can to bind to the microorganism, bring it inside, and break it down. And again, that sounds great, right? Yay! The bacterium was phagocytized by the phagocytic cell. This is wonderful. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about microbes that not only can survive being phagocytized, but actually prefer to be phagocytized and then replicate in the immune cells. So for every defense, they have come up with a counter strategy. Not every microbe, but many. And so that's kind of the goal of phagocytosis is hopefully to degrade the pathogen. Doesn't always work that way. Um, and inside, this is the last slide we'll talk about today. How does a phagocytic cell actually digest a microorganism? Well, when, so we'll go back to this slide real quick. So when a microorganism or anything is internalized by a phagocytic cell, it's inside a vesicle that we call the phagosome. And within these phagocytic cells, there are other vesicles that contain enzymes, antimicrobial compounds, usually an acidic pH, and we call those lysosomes. What should happen, if everything goes according to plan, you have your microorganism in the phagosome, you have your lysosome with all of the stuff to kill the microorganism, and they come together and they fuse. And that structure is called a phagolysosome. So within the phagolysosome, you should have your microbe, your, these are like um, free radicals, reactive oxygen species, other antimicrobial peptides, a, a lower pH, that should then break down right, the microorganism. And so what else is in that lysosome structure that becomes the phagolysosome, you have um, free radicals or reactive oxygen species like hydrogen peroxide or superoxide. Uh, you have activated halides, you have peroxidases, nitric oxide, and then you have things like acids, lysozyme, um, ion chelators, specifically iron chelators, um, and other proteins that can damage the membrane. And you have proteases to help break down microbial proteins. So it's basically the most toxic soup imaginable. So you wouldn't think that things could get through, but spoiler alert, lots of things do. 
So hopefully, and I'll ask you one question before you leave. Do you remember how microbes can deal with hydrogen peroxide? Catalase. Yep. Many, many, many microbes produce an enzyme called catalase that turns hydrogen peroxide into hydrogen and, or oxygen and water. Makes bubbles. Remember, you drop some hydrogen peroxide on a smear and you got bubbles? Okay. So that's just one strategy that some microbes have to avoid being destroyed in the phagolysosome. Okay. So we'll pick up on Monday with more of the immune system, um, and then we'll start getting into the first things are gram positive caucus shaped bacterium. So things like staph and strep. Have a great weekend. I'll see you all on Monday.